Amazing innovation. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, this is our annual showcase event. And I want to give you a little bit of history for those of you who are a little bit newer to MSU Global. We started out over a dozen years ago by helping to create MSU's online strategy for degree programs and certificates. Today, that has grown to about 14,000 enrollments, Jerry tells me, in over 30 degree and certificate programs, which is quite a bit for our peer institutions. So we have got a lot of online learning going on. There's more people studying online in the summer than on campus. That's not a surprise. That's also the fastest growing segment. We have a lot of MSU students taking online courses, and we helped facilitate the policies and the procedures for getting that started. Shortly after that, we we said, let's take everything we know about online learning and apply it to non-credit. So we've been helping facilitate the growth of that. We initiated with a bunch of other people the first campus-wide non-credit enrollment system. And today, that supports, in the last year, almost 10,000 enrollments and a million dollars in revenue. So that's, that's not at all at everything that the campus does. That's just a little slice of it to give you an idea. Um, since after that, we expanded from non-credit to focusing on competency-based approaches. We've done that with the Ag Tech program, and we've also done that with ACAP, which is the um, counterfeit group, and uh, they're trying to do more industry training, so we're taking a competency-based approach to that, which is very popular now in terms of what high, where higher ed is going, competency-based personalized learning, so we have expertise in that. And we've created knowledge systems like open knowledge repositories that have helped faculty uh, have an edge in competing for grants in fields like food safety, the career success in, uh, project in the graduate school, and the new USAID Center for Global Food System Innovation. So we've also helped facilitate new models of massive open online courses, and there's a couple people here today that have done some of the first four experiments at MSU. And the ones that we initiated have more of a sort of a research focus, MOOCs for research, focused on co-creating and disseminating knowledge. Since we met last year, we've initiated a new program called our MSU Global Fellows Program. And some of our, we've got four of those. Some of those people are here today. So these are groups of people. So um, we've got Jeff Grable and Julie Lindquist focusing on writing at scale and online. We have um, Greg Ostick, if you want to stand up, Greg, working out of the Kramer Lab, working on a new open commercialization, sort of open hardware, open data approach for photosynthesis. Uh, we have Gender Violence, the Gender Violence Consortium, and Ruben will be up here in a minute. I don't see where Ruben's sitting, but there he is. <laughs> oh, you took your jacket off, all right? Uh, you'll hear about that. And then uh, Food Fraud with John Spink um, in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Those are fellows where we take everything we know about online learning, non-credit, competency-based learning, knowledge systems, and MOOCs, and apply them in service to a particular focus that faculty have. And we do that in alignment with our college deans so that we can kind of co-invest. We invest our expertise. They invest um, in all the different ways they invest in research centers. So that's new this year. And this year, we're also starting a new Boulder by Design initiative. It's called Spartan Core. And Jerry and Dale Elshoff, Dale, I thought I saw here, Dale over there are leading that one, and in this, we're really taking everything we know and we're organizing, we're this is an exploration and experiment at this phase, we're taking everything we know in service to experiential learning. Because experiential learning is where a lot of the value of MSU's intangible brand value, that's where it is, it's in things like study abroad, internships, capstone experiences, service learning, that's where the intangible, we call them intangible, they're not that intangible really, but this is where a lot of the values of MSU's, you know, transforming lives, boulder by design qualities, that's where they show up. And we think there's quite a bit we can do to superpower some of those experiences uh, using technology. So that's our experiment for this year. We look forward to working with all of you on that. It's pretty, pretty bold. So anyway, we'd like to thank you for being part of the conversation. So I'd like my staff to stand up where people can see you, MSU Global staff. We have two new people this year, actually three people. Stacy uh, is new on our staff in the orange shirt. Um, Patrick Hayes, our manager for, senior manager for communication. Finally, a dedicated, you'd think, the group that helps people market and PR and have a dedicated <laughs> marketing and PR person, right? Well, we finally do, <laughs> that's Patrick. And Rashad Mohammed manning the camera today, has also started as our new um, um, technology specialist. And is, is anybody who's here on our board, would you stand up? Board members, we have a new advisory board this year, John Canini, 
All right. And our fellows, would you please stand up? Julie, Jeff. <laughs> yes, your fellows. It's official. There you go. I want to just thank you all for being part of MSU Global and um, helping us move forward and do interesting, innovative things that we're now going to hear about. Thank you. Okay, I need Julie and Ruben and John Canini to all come up and take a take stool. Brent Ross. <coughs> Charlie Rose or an Oprah, but this was the idea I had in mind, you know? Dating game. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what so I'll have to do a little passing on the mics, okay? Um, we get asked a lot, because we do so many different things, we get asked a lot, well, what do you guys do exactly? What's MSU Global? Right? And there's like three units on campus called them. There's some MSU Global things. What are we? We, we change the two words after our um, name every once in a while this year. It's called MSU Global Learning and Knowledge Solutions or Innovations. Learning and Knowledge Innovations, I think it is. But we get this question a lot. So I thought, well, what better way to answer it than to have the people that we're working with actually answer the question. You know, what's your work and how are we helping you is really all I wanted to ask. Um, and actually, I wanted to start with um, Brent, because Brent's a new faculty member, relatively new at MSU. And what, what, how do you answer that question? What, what do you, how are we helping you do your work? What, what is your work? <laughs> well, um, first of all, I'm uh, Brent Ross. I'm an assistant professor in the <coughs> Department of Ag, Food, and Resource Economics. And I've been here for about five years, and I actually had an opportunity to engage with MSU Global on several projects. Um, the Egg Share Project, MSU ENET, and the Global University. And I think, you know, one of the things that has been good for us is that, when, especially when we're starting getting the MSU ENET going, is that MSU Global has helped us to facilitate some relationships that we never would have thought of trying to make um, otherwise. And in particular, they helped us set up some relationships with a uh, university in Saudi Arabia and a university in Togo that allowed us to do uh, entrepreneurship training that allowed to have MSU students and students from those other three universities together in one virtual classroom. And so, and, that, and that's really worked out really well. And, and if you ask the students that have participated in that program, the, the one thing that they would say they get the most value out of that program is the ability to be able to collaborate with students from other universities. And I think MSU Global was really key in enabling us to do that. Um, also in terms of some research um, things, it, MSU Global has, you know, back to the ENET, in thinking about how entrepreneurship training takes place and how entrepreneurs go through a, uh, the process that they do, we often teach it as a sequential process. Well, really, we know that that's really not the case. And some of the, the tools that MSU Global have allow us to create these modules. And, that, and they allow us to track, we'd, we'd be able to track how they would move through those modules. And so we get, um, we're able to get a greater understanding of how entrepreneurs think, how they engage the world, and, and the processes they go through. And so, to me, that, that's pretty neat. Thanks, Jeff. Should we just go down the road? Jeff, you want to take a, take a turn at the mic? No, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you are. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm Jeff Grable. I'm a, I'm a professor in a department called Writing, Rhetoric, and American Cultures in the College of Arts and Letters. And uh, I think, well, one of the ways I'll answer that question is I've been here long enough that um, Chris and the people at Global are still return my phone calls, <laughs> which which is actually where I want to begin. So um, what I like about Chris and with the way in which Global has been a resource to me and to my colleagues is that, um, that we've built a relationship over time and they're willing to invest at different time scales. So some of the conversations that Chris and I have been having, we've literally been having for years and years and years. And some of those conversations are just now starting to sort of bear fruit. So sometimes 
Um, it's a willingness of, of colleagues on campus to be available to you for conversation about ideas which are poorly formed and ill-conceived and directionless. Um, but be willing to be in conversation and in a relationship with you over time to see where those ideas and those conversations take you. And um, For me, Global has been an indispensable resource in that regard. And um, also one of my um, desperately needed creative outlets on this campus. So when I need people to be creative and to think horizontally with me, uh, to be open to new ideas, um, Chris is one of the first people that I call. And Chris's people, as I've gotten to know more and more people inside Global, um, I'm beginning to realize, much to my delight, how deep that resource pool really is. And so some of the things that we've been able to actually achieve most recently with Global, it, it's been years, and we actually been in conversation years and years and years and years. About and a years decade. And years. <laughs> that was, yeah, Good so ideas take a long time. Nice just putting a real finite number on that, a decade. God, yes, a decade. So about a decade before we actually did something sort of concrete together. Um, and for me, as a, as a teacher and as, uh, as an intellectual on this campus, um, I can't, um, that's been indispensable. Otherwise, I think I would have sort of crawled in a hole and died at certain points in time. So it's been really important. So it is, well, what I'm saying is that it, this is a remarkable, universities are remarkably dynamic places, but some places are more dynamic than others. Um, this is one of them. Uh, my, my name is John Kahene, and um, I'm a professor in the College of Human Medicine and College of Human Medicine. And my area, especially, is epidemiology. And um, LSU Global, I think I've worked with for about eight years. And I can't begin to tell you how much this has helped me. Uh, my area of interest is research and training, particularly graduate uh, students' training. So when I came to them, we were just passing up ideas and so on. And all of a sudden, we got involved in a, in a, in a really big grant funded by the uh, by Gates Foundation called uh, uh, Share. But the important thing that for me was the way of thinking that I got from the uh, LSU Global to merge my interest in what we call action research and how to package this information so that different people can use it in different countries, across different campuses, but also from the uh, putting that information to the uh, people who need it most, the stakeholders, right from the farm, the farmers all the, to the universities. This has been extremely helpful. But as that was a seed, the interesting thing beyond that was the relationship that that project gave us to make linkages with different universities. And as a result of those relationships, we have been able to attract actually three grants. One from USAID, one from the uh, the, 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 the United Nations, and actually another one from USDA, uh, uh, Foreign Agricultural Services. So we couldn't have gotten those without the relationship that we created in different universities. And the training that and research that we are doing with those grants is actually a model of verifying or validating a model that we tested or we developed with ActShare. Action research where we get students involved, hands on, and then avoiding this myth that you can do research, put your thesis or your dissertation on the bookshelf and expect people to get it. But really getting the students to process that information, put things online, and send it back across the value chain as we call it. So I, I don't think I would have thought about that myself because I was trained traditionally, doing your research, you publish, and whoever reads it, that's their problem, okay? <laughs> so that, to me, that's the most important thing I've learned from uh, the action. Hey, thanks, John. Um, Ruben, before you go, re coming out, well, related to these are sort of parallel discussions. Um, I don't think Maria Lipinski's here. For the last two um, events that we've had, Maria Lipinski's gotten up and talking about translational scholars. And which is that's really blossomed with the help of the USAID grant, one of the Higher Education Solutions Network grants that's in its second year, called the Center for Global Food Systems Innovation. And a big piece of that are 50 translational scholars that actually 
are incorporating what came out of AgShare, the AgShare method as we called it, in terms of the role of students, what they're actually doing as part of a research team is now embodied in a slightly different way, but at the core it's exactly the same. And these things are really closely related. And what I'd like to do, Ali is here, he's one of the students that's helped create the Translational Scholar Core for CGFSI, and has also been working over the last year or so on the One Health Initiative that has seven translational scholars. And do you want to say a couple words? Because it's, it was, it's another example of the relationships and how a whole new way of thinking about how students engage in what you do and create knowledge is coming to life. Thank you very much, Chris. My name is Ali Hussain. I have done master's in health communication here, and I am in first year PhD with MIS. And I have been part of the One Health project that just mentioned, and that has a big translational scholar core. Aisha Razak, who is also here, is basically the manager of that. I have moved to a different position now, but I can share my experience of what has been done. It's basically the idea is that now people are thinking that most of the good ideas for development may not be coming from labs, but from dorm rooms. So they want to engage more of more of these students. Um, as part of like, when I joined this thing, I was kind of fascinated by this word translational because it's the first time I, I basically heard it. And the meaning behind it is, is to build the capability to translate the findings from one field into something meaningful for the others. And that is a big thing to do, the integration and the bridge. So we have been working in this for some, for some time now with Chris Guyte and Maria Lepinski. Um, there are a few important things to know about it. The first thing is that it's not something informal that we do. Donors are giving a lot of importance to integrated ideas. So we need to integrate and bridge. And TSCs form that bridge. Um, second thing is that it's not just informally do. We have a formal way to do it. We have meetings, we have social media, we have other ways to basically integrate and connect. So it's something that is ongoing, it's something that is actually leading to something tangible deliverables. Um, that's the very short introduction, but Aisha can share more when she will share. Thank you. Bye-bye. Aisha. Aisha. Ah, so we haven't actually met yet. Thank you for coming today. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't Hi, my name is Aisha Razak. Ali gave you a brief um, introduction. I had no idea you knew I was here, so I was eating my crepes when you pointed out. <laughs> and I started gathering my thoughts. But anyway, um, I uh, recently graduated from the College of Education here at Michigan State University uh, from the Higher Adult and Lifelong Education Program. Um, and I recently, just recently joined uh, GCFSI as their TSC lead, as the Translational Scholar Score lead. Um, uh, prior to this, I've been working in Pakistan um, on a USA project again, but related to teacher education, which is my, my primary area of research. Uh, but anyway, um, as uh, Ali pointed out, um, USAID is through the GCFSI grant is placing a very um, heavy emphasis on student engagement. It's, it's uh, one of the things, besides other things, I mean the center, uh, the, the larger objective is to uh, address issues of food shortage um, in the Feed the Future countries. But within that larger project, uh, they're placing a very heavy focus on um, things related to students. Uh, more student engagement because they are the future scholars who are supposed to go out and fix these problems. Um, and they wanted to do it in a, in a different way, different than traditional ways in which we train students and scholars in our universities and colleges. We have no idea, we had no idea what that different way is. And um, so one of the um, initial proposals, um, and I'm saying this because I've, I've just started working, I'm looking at the older documents and trying to figure out where we're going, um, uh, was to engage students in competency-based experiential learning, which is what I, th I think your center is also, also doing and wants to do. Um, uh, so the idea was to embed students, take students, both undergraduate and graduate level students, embed them in uh, faculty research teams and make them a part of, you know, the kind of research um, faculty are doing in different colleges across, um, um, across MSU 
to fix these problems um, um, or you know to uh, to help find out more about these problems around food shortage food supply those kind of issues um, embed them and uh, which which sounds a lot like what graduate students do anyway uh, because you know they help faculty with their research on in their graduate assistantships in their research assistantships but this this provides them this particular strand provides them um, a more richer experience in 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 the sense that um, they are more deeply involved. They are working with faculty as their colleagues. They are traveling to other countries. They are attending conferences. They are presenting their work. They are trying to come up with solutions that can be implemented. I mean, eventually they'll go out, implement those solutions. You know, look at their impact, hopefully, and disseminate. Um, but then there is another, this, this second strand of TSE, Translational Scholars, that we're trying to work on, which is to work on this area as an area of scholarship, where we can actually research student engagement. What should it look like? What are the kind of competencies that we want to you know, build in these students? What are the best ways of doing that? Uh, what are some of the best models? And uh, I'm sure one of the models is going to emerge out of the Global Center. Um, and you know, um, how best to provide those experiences to students. So those those kind of things. Basically, two strands where students are working, you know, having becoming a part of those experiences, but also doing it as an area of scholarship where we look at, you know, how. To Thank you. You're going to hear echoes of the same thing that Aisha and Ali just shared um, when we talk about Spartan, the Spartan Core Initiative, the role of students. And also, it just came from Stephen Thomas was uh, with me, as was Benny Gore at the post-secondary convening of the Gates Foundation, the, um, the education group. And um, this, I did a presentation on uh, university innovation. I was on a panel, I was sitting on a stool just like that, as a matter of fact. And they were talking about how come universities don't invest like other segments of business, types of businesses, in outside consultants for digital strategy and innovation. And I said, well, maybe one of the reasons is we have something that they don't have. We have a secret weapon for innovation. We have students, right? And they're not just consumers of what we offer. They are partners, right? They are co-creators of knowledge. And businesses don't have that. We have that. And it'd be interesting to see. I think this is these kinds of models are ways to leverage that and explore it further. So I'm really excited that, that it sounds like it's not just this grant, but also the College of Communication Arts and Sciences through Maria Lipinski are doing a new initiative for as part of their Boulder by Design that I don't know a lot of details about, but they're looking to kind of raise up this role for students, the competencies, the potential certification. So this becomes a more formalized role. And as I've spread this um, idea around at conferences over the last couple of weeks, our peer institutions like Penn State are really interested in doing the same kind of thing and collaborating with us. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. But it came, the original seed of it, John, came from your work in AgShare and the role of the students. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> and Ruben, with that, I'll pass it on to you. Well, uh, good morning. My name is Ruben Parra Cardona. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies and associate director of the MSU Research Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Our experience with you guys has been really great. It has been really wonderful in terms of, I, I would think about three areas. The first one it has helped us to integrate and maximize our potential as a group. As a consortium, we are integrated with faculty from several departments and colleges uh, specializing in, in very important areas of gender-based violence, all the way from policy, sexual assault, uh, service to survivors, perpetrators, uh, international impact. So I would, I would think uh, the first area of impact has been helping us to integrate and maximize what we can do in terms of our scholarship and, and, and the dissemination which would be the second area, would be uh, making sure that we are providing an opportunity for those who are interested and need our scholarship who can have easy access to that. And the third area is really helping us to increase our potential for obtaining external funding as we're engaging not only with federal agencies in grant seeking efforts but also with foundations. Um, as an example of the first one, uh, we had a great uh, strategic planning meeting uh, full morning, and that was great. I remember the first instruction was to identify few few areas of um, uh, goals, and we came up with 20. And folks were like, "You have to 
reduce them, you know that it's going to help us. So we ended up with 10 integrated goals, right? So we cheated a little bit. Uh, but it was great because we had not uh, met as a group. I think people are very busy and very successful. Uh, many of our uh, members of our group are consultants for large federal initiatives. Social policy has been um, shaped after a lot of the scholarship that has been done by group members. But uh, it's very difficult for us to find the spaces to come together and have a common vision. And so that has been a wonderful process that we have experienced. We have a faculty who just joined uh, MSU, who is our department chair, but also did a critique, a gender-based critique of the Fifty Shades of Grey. So if you, I think you've heard about that, right? <laughs> uh, but she did a, a really good critique of that. Well, one of the journalists in Mexico picked on that critique and tweeted and, and reference her all the way here. And I was so excited because somebody, a leading person in Mexico, was doing that work and included a synthesis of that work and links to the work and all the analysis. Well, that's very important in the global context because in Mexico, we're in the midst of fighting for legislation of violence against women. And, but unfortunately, a lot of what I share with my group, a lot of the knowledge stays within the United States. So one of, of the things I've shared with the group, the importance of going global at the national level, but also international level, because people are really, truly looking after us for uh, helping us shape policy, helping us shape intervention in developing countries, in countries where you know, many of the battles that have been fought here for years are starting to be fought. And the last uh, piece, I think, the way we come across to funders. Uh, you know, like when you write, write for an NIH grant, that specific aims page is so critical because reviewers are going to get excited or not about your proposal, and that's going to determine how they read the rest of your proposal. Our web page, you know, was kind of like, it was okay, but not like exciting and difficult to access information, and that's a huge contribution that you are helping us to make sure that that's a very engaging instrument that we can use not only with colleagues, researchers, but the population that benefit for services related to our research, but also funders. With limited time, we want to generate in few minutes a lot of excitement and really convey the impact of that we're doing. We don't have that, that expertise. You guys have that expertise, and, and we're very excited about that uh, taking place right now. And Julie. Good morning. My name is Julie Lindquist. I'm Jeff's colleague in the Department of Writing, Rhetoric, and American Cultures. I direct the first-year writing program, and so I am interested in access, education, writing, writing students. Um, Jeff and I have offices next door to each other, which makes it convenient to meet in the hallway and cook up all kinds of schemes. Um, so I'm sure that what I have to say echoes you know, the kinds of things that have been said about how generative MSU Global is. Um, but I'll, I'll start by saying this. So I have a student, I have a graduate student who was talking to me yesterday about alternative career paths. Um, and he was interested in things that had sort of intellectual heavy lifting involved, but with an entrepreneurial edge. And I said, you need to talk to Chris Guyth because she is the best idea, idea maker happener that I know. And so I think that that's- My new title, Chief Idea, idea maker, maker Happener. happener. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's what occurred to me immediately because um, as I've gotten to know Chris and work with the MSU Global team, of course they're, they're, they're very good at finding money and sources of support and connections that academics usually don't have on the radar because you know we're these paradigmatic thinkers who you know do a really good job of imagining what projects are and look like and dwell in this lovely inventional space for a while and then have to be reminded that maybe they should live in the world somewhere and do something um, and so uh, yeah um, so you know Chris has been um, wonderful in helping us think about what our work is you said how you enable our work you help us see what our work is and what it should do I mean I, I think that's been um, really, really helpful. Um, I can't think of anyone better at sort of facilitating and midwiving ideas in that way, you know, figuring out where they live, what the audiences are, what the impacts can be. Um, and so um, Jeff has talked a little bit about the MOOC project, and Chris has been instrumental in that, and the MSU Global team, um, from concept to development to support um, of various kinds. Um, I can give you another example, and that is the Literacy Corps Michigan project that uh, my colleague Bump Halbreder and I have been working on. Um, and Bump is in, on the advisory board, right? Yeah. Uh, and that is, that is a very different sort of project than the MOOC. It is about making documentary pieces, doing a kind of long-term qualitative interview, field-based research. How's that? 
um, that produces documentary pieces about students and their experiences, um, with the idea that the university has all kinds of data on students. You know, um, they want to help them persist. They want to retain students. Um, and what we're doing is trying to figure out how to ask the right questions and show the right things that will give people a sense of students' lives and experiences that would otherwise be unavailable. Um, the problem with a project like this is that it's long-term, slow-moving, hard to sell. It doesn't yield an immediate kind of data that can return to you know, make its own case. And so you know, Chris was very um, important in helping us think about how we can make this into a thing and not just a series of commitments and values and ideas that seemed pretty good. Uh, so we met several times at you know places that had good refreshment infrastructures. Is that the way? In order to in order to see this, um, and so um, Chris has been sort of helping us follow it and develop it as it proceeds to figure out what the products are and where they can go. Um, I think I'll stop there. So thank uh, I got to thank all of you. I really wasn't thinking that this was a like a roast or something, but you know. <laughs> I would thank you from my heart for sharing, you know, how we've helped you do your work. And it's, it's a hard story to tell, you know, it's hard to summarize in research revenue or reputation or five outcomes or we're not a typical service, you know, it's really hard to describe. So thank you for helping us explain you know, how we do our work. Um, we do tend to, we do want to concentrate on um, certain outcomes for all of our projects. And we, there's the aspirational and there's what's reality, like what are we actually able to achieve. The three outcomes that we focus on are, for all of you and all of the, our clients that we work with, raising your reputation you know, as the go-to place in your field if, with your research question or your network of specialty, um, generating new sources of revenue, which could come from online, non-credit, grants and contracts, you know, donations, um, sponsorship, you know, so helping you tap into new ones that you might not otherwise think about or have access to. Um, so research and research, and that's I have Steve Hansen to thank for that. I don't think he's here today. So Steve Hansen, ever since we started the Food Safety Knowledge Network about five years ago, every time I would see him, Chris, this is great, but how's it resulting in research and scholarship? You know? <laughs> okay, I'm going to figure that out. So it took me a few years, but I figured out how to, how to answer that question. So it's one of our R's: research, revenue, and reputation. And it's not that we do the research. It's not necessarily research about teaching and learning outcomes, although that could be part of it. It's really how do we help your disciplinary research. You know, how, John, how are we helping you expand your agenda for, you know, livestock and One Health initiatives? And Brent, you know, how are we helping you work on agribusiness growth and what are the factors that improve, you know, what are the factors that make things work in the marketplace? And, you know, Jeff and Julie, I'm really fascinated by, you know, the pedagogical approaches to writing, right, which is amazing to me that writing is such at the core of everything higher education does. Yet the pedagogy of writing is a relatively uh, new area, and you have an opportunity to really build your reputation as the go-to place for writing online and at scale. So I think that's a really compelling. And Ruben, the consortium that you're part of for gender violence, there's, it's, uh, there's lots of great questions in there, but a lot of what you do is capacity building around the world, potentially, for people that are in these roles of helping and preventing gender violence. And all those people aren't just receivers of your training, but they're potentially partners in the co-creation and gathering of new knowledge and interpretation in local circumstances. And that's what is compelling about your work from our perspective, too, because we think we have the tools to really help you leverage that. So we have about 10 minutes, and what I'd like, so I'll give you like each two minutes, okay, just to kind of gauge it a little bit. Um, with the research revenue and reputation, how are we doing so far on those outcomes? Uh, you know, some of it, you know, there's no revenue, new revenue yet, you know, but just give a, a solution. We're, I'm not saying we're, we attempt to do all those things. They're aspirational. They don't all pan out or haven't panned out yet. Lots of these things take a long time. How are we doing on it? John, do you want to start? Uh, Research, revenue, reputation. How are we doing for you on those three things? Mm -hmm. Is that awesome? I think you got to, here, watch <laughs> okay. I think as far as uh, revenue in terms of research and training, uh, in my area and my colleagues, I think you are doing very well. We have been able to, to use the backgrounds and so on, like I said, to attract uh, four or three really big grants, and there's another one pending that uh, knock on wood we might get. So uh, that kind of repetition probably wouldn't have had that kind of chance without those relationships I'm talking about. And people have started to, to know 
what we can do, particularly in the areas of packaging the information from the research and making it accessible to others. Because that's something that really, really is intrigued a lot of people. That something that you can do in Makerere in Uganda can be reached by somebody in um, South India. We are working with the University of South India and so on. So they are sharing all the research findings and the students, uh, you know, in the chat, they are sharing data. I think that is helping MSU in general, uh, and then of course helping the universities in Africa that we work with. And that's part of the um, part of that so that ecosystem that makes that happen are the role of students, like translational scholars, and also open content strategies as well. Thank you, John. Ruben or Jeff. You guys can fight over which is the live right. microphone. <laughs> Um, I think uh, we're doing very good and we are very close to really solidifying very uh, specific uh, achievements. I want um, six years ago, University of Outreach and Engagement supported me to establish a collaboration in Monterrey, Mexico on parenting work. A month ago, I was with folks from the USA International Development Agency who are very interested in funding uh, Chris Sullivan, who is the director of the initiative model on advocacy for Mexico and they want to fund a pilot study and if that's successful uh, they want to launch that at a national level and in the meeting I only had like 10 minutes with the most important folks and it was so important to go to the web base and walk people through the resources we have in a more efficient way that you guys really help us to to, to solidify so that's one of very concrete examples of how they the impact that uh, we can um, we can have in a very succinct way. And the same is happening at the national level with private foundations that are very interested in solidifying lines of research and, and fostering those collaborations that you were talking about, not only with the service providers, but also consumers at different levels. Uh, consumers as students who want to develop lines of research in lines that our faculty have developed, but also uh, for advocacy centers and create that, that level of energy. So I think we're very, very close to very, very specific new, new achievements thanks to that synergy of resources. Okay, so we haven't delivered yet, but we're getting there. We just it's started with very, you. Very, we started like a few <laughs> months ago. So in, in, the, in, the, in the outcomes have, I mean, we've been noticing how uh, relevant it has been. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Jeff, do you want to go? Sure. Um, we're the slow train. A decade, a decade in the making. In the making. <laughs> and, we're, and we're still emerging. Um, so I think we're making good progress across all, uh, across all three. Um, where we've had the most concrete outcomes is in reputation building. So we, we're very, we're very, we have a very good reputation within my discipline um, as a faculty. And so we weren't starting from scratch in that regard, but uh, Chris really pushed us hard to think very differently about leveraging the, the MOOC moment that we had this past summer um, as a way of building reputation. Now that only works if we're smart and good, um, so we have some obligations on my end to actually um, do something that's not embarrassing. But We had, the, I think, the largest MOOC so far, 2,000 people? We did, which is weird, because um, we, <laughs> cause we bootstrapped it pretty, bootstrapped it. Um, so on reputation, I think we're doing a really nice job. Um, and as you've noticed, there's a number of projects in my department that Chris is working with us on. The research um, is emergent. Um, some of that takes some time. Um, I think that will bear fruit as well. The issue for writing is not online. It's actually just at scale. Um, scale is a really hard problem when feedback is a really integral part of, of what leads to improvement and learning outcomes. So getting high quality feedback at scale is an exceptionally complex problem and it's a problem that all MOOCs have whether they realize it or not. Um, and uh, so that's really the really hard nut we're trying to crack in that regard. And then re revenue, yes, <laughs> please dear God, revenue. Um, we, we, I mean we explicitly have to figure out if we're going to continue to innovate in this particular area um, then we're going to have to find the ways to, uh, as they say, monetize it. Uh, and we're working hard on that. And have a thinking partner, which is great. Uh, yeah, again, I think it's um, in, in progress. I think one of the lucky things that, in my experience, is that we kind of had a, had a quick hit with MSU Global and working with that group, with the, with the ENET group. I mean, they were really uh, key in helping us set up those relationships with those other universities around the world. And, and that generated funding for us that allowed us to continue the ENET program over the last three or four years. And so it, 
it did generate revenue for us and allowed us to keep going. Uh, it's been a little slower maybe on the research side. We have uh, started to pull out some of the research from that ENET program in terms of uh, the benefits to students. Um, I think where we really see the benefit going forward though is looking at that process, how people engage in that process, and then also more so with the um, global university uh, who they're still in the process trying to find some uh, revenue for that project, but that's really neat because you look at these, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, that MSC Global really allows us to look at these multi-stakeholder groups and how people collaborate and, and very diverse groups of stakeholders. And so we're developing research questions around that because of the tools that MSU Global um, allows, it, or some of the things that MSU Global allows us to do. Um, and of course, as a, you know, as a young faculty member, I'm still trying to build up my, my reputation, and, and I, I think it's coming, but uh, you never know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brent. And Julie? I don't know what I have to add. I'm sorry. I don't know what I have to add other than what Jeff has said on behalf of writing the writing program and uh, and the RAC department and what has been happening there. Other than um, to say a little bit more about the example of the MOOC, which was developed um, because, well, essentially because we wanted to learn more about writing and how writers work and how teaching works and how this can happen, and saw the MOOC as a really good opportunity to do that. So that was the original impulse. So the research um, motive was was deep and strong in that way. Um, so research, reputation, um, MSU Global helped us to run a series of webinars which really increased the visibility of the writing MOOC and of you know the faculty here as people who might reasonably be good at providing it and thinking about these things. Um, and so it was offered not for credit starting out and so it wasn't immediately revenue generating but we imagine with the, Jeff said, slow train Jeff, is that what you said? Uh, with the kinds of research opportunities and, and visibility that it's that it's delivered, um, that this is this is likely. Cool, thanks. While we have one minute, I'm going to come over here to Greg and ask you, since this, we're working with you in a relatively new way too, maybe you can talk about. I don't think we've delivered any of the three R's yet, but maybe you can talk about what we are doing to help you with your concept. Uh, I'm Greg. Uh, I work in the Kramer Lab in the Plant um, Biology Department, so we're developing a handheld device to measure photosynthesis, and then a platform for pulling that information from the user to the web, and then sharing it among all users. So uh, I'm not really a plant biologist, but they really think that the, that the measurement is cool. But I think what, what has been so helpful, actually, in terms of working with Chris, is that um, the most cool part of this is the platform where anyone can ask a scientific question, and then engage any other users in answering that scientific question, in the field, sort of in real time, which is cool. Um, and then also, you know, eventually be able to get that information out to the public. So, not just academics to be researchers, but regular folks to be able to be researchers and ask interesting questions. So, um, I think the most helpful thing um, that Chris has provided is not only connections with other folks uh, at MSU and in other places who might be good partners for this, but also um, engaging me in the thought that this is a little bit bigger than plant biology and could have applications and interest outside of that because everybody in, you know, in, in the Kramer lab is just like, well, let's make the tool as cool for photosynthesis as possible. You know, but it's actually a lot bigger than that. And that, I really appreciated that. So. Okay. Well, I'm gonna thank all of my panelists up here on the stools and all of you who participated in the conversation, Greg and Aisha and Ali. We are so honored and privileged to be working with you. There are about 5,000 faculty at MSU, all with really interesting research questions and areas of work, and we, it is never a dull moment, and you really challenge us to think creatively with you in terms of shooting for those three, reputation, revenue, um, and research, using all the technology tools that we know about and those that are emerging. <laughs> so that we can apply that not just in service to your initiatives, but also create models that can be adopted widely by the whole campus. And I thank you for letting us work with you. Thank you all. Thanks for the conversation.